So today I would like uh, to focus uh, on the exploitment of X-ray spectroscopies and in particular uh, of X-ray absorption spectroscopy and X-ray emission spectroscopy to address functional mechanism in battery materials. I will show for this purpose uh, some scientific examples uh, of works that we have done uh, here at ALBA uh, within uh, a, a long-term collaboration uh, in between my group, uh, Andrea Sorrentino from Mistral Dreamline, still at ALBA, Stefano Passerini from the Helmut Institute and uh, his group, uh, and Dino Tonti from the CEFIC uh, close to here uh, in Barcelona. Why the scientific case? Of course, the CO2 reduction uh, is uh, a common target. Uh, and uh, this implies to improve the energy harvesting and storage technologies. And uh, as we know, batteries uh, are by far the most ubiquitous uh, energy storage technology which are currently employed. So now here, I, I would like to show you how X-ray spectroscopy can be useful to study such uh, materials. As I already advanced, uh, I will focus uh, on absorption and emission spectroscopy, both in the hard and soft X-ray regime, uh, which are of particular interest uh, as it has been shown uh, by the, the, the strong increase uh, of their application uh, uh, to study such materials. Uh, first of all, I would like to briefly introduce uh, the ALBA synchrotron uh, and the beam lines uh, uh, which are uh, available there. Uh, the ALBA interest uh, in the battery research was rising in the last years, and now it became uh, one of the main strategic fields of research. This is demonstrated also from the fact that the seven over 10 beam lines uh, are working in uh, uh, energy related application, uh, mainly in battery research. Uh, uh, class, of course, the beamline of which I'm beamline responsible, uh, providing X-ray absorption and emission spectroscopy in a wider energy range, MSPD, X-ray diffraction, Mistral, soft XM and soft XAS, Circe NAP, providing XPS and soft XAS, Miras to access the infrared, and CD to access SAS and WAX. So these are the current uh, ALBA capabilities. So we see that we have access in situ, operando uh, in uh, most of the beam line, so we can study the local ele electronic structure, the long range structure and the morphology uh, with the uh, uh, operando conditions. Uh, as well, we can probe molecule molecules uh, uh, with uh, operando conditions. Uh, uh, instead, uh, in the soft X-ray range, uh, uh, we can access electronic structure at the nanometer scale uh, or on the surface, uh, but only uh, ex situ at the moment. <clears throat> there are, of course, laboratories uh, offered to USEX, uh, and it's of particular interest uh, in the framework of this talk uh, to highlight the fact that we are building a laboratory fully dedicated to the battery investigation. So in this talk, I will focus on X-ray absorption and X-ray emission spectroscopy, both in the soft and the hard X-ray uh, regime. And what I would like to stress is the importance of complementary information. So the importance of a multi-technique approach in order to disentangle completely the structural and electronic parameters. Uh, the example that uh, I choose uh, is uh, a lithium-rich cadet. Here you can see uh, the chemical formula, and the experimental approach uh, was to probe uh, um, uh, oxygen, manganese, nickel, cobalt, k adages, manganese L3, uh, l edge SAS, and manganese uh, K-beta XS. So, um, a multi-technique approach. Uh, why we choose uh, this system? Uh, okay, so of course, a system of uh, interest uh, for application. So you know that most of our devices uh, are working with the lithium cobalt oxide cadets, which uh, uh, deliver a relatively low capacity, 150 million per hour per gram. Uh, the, 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 the capacity defines the specific energy, which would like to increase uh, for the application. Here on the right, uh, you can see how this specific energy 
uh, has been increased uh, by, uh, by chemicals substituted in cobalt, uh, partially or uh, totally, with other transition metal like uh, nickel or manganese uh, and lithium, lithium rich, rich materials, uh, achieving uh, a much higher uh, delivered capacity uh, above uh, 300 million per hour per gram. So the subject uh, of the studies uh, which uh, I will report uh, mainly in this presentation is this particular cathod uh, with the huge experimental capacity, uh, which show good specific energy and cycle instability with reduced environmental cost, but uh, as a drawback, as a capacity fade upon cycling. Here on the left, you can see uh, the electrochemical curve of the first cycle. Along the first charge, uh, it occurs a voltage plateau, which disappears later on, where some irreversible reactions occur uh, that then further limit uh, the capacity. So what we want to understand is what is happening here. In order to understand uh, the, uh, the delivered capacity, uh, we have to understand the role of the different constituents of the cathode. Uh, a portion of uh, that capacity can be ascribed to the nickel and cobalt oxid uh, uh, oxidation. But uh, what about the rest, uh, the majority, from where it's coming from? Uh, what is the role of manganese uh, and oxygen? Oxygen uh, has been pointed out as uh, a probable responsible uh, of uh, such capacity, capacity, but uh, quantitatively, in which extent? So these are the questions. What we want to do is uh, to fully characterize the charge compensation mechanism in such uh, material and experimental approach is uh, to uh, use uh, multi-edge SAS in different, uh, in different uh, energy ranges and uh, its ray emission spectroscopy to get complementary information, uh, in particular at the manganese uh, KBIT emission line. Uh, we will, uh, uh, I will present uh, uh, results obtained on, uh, on, uh, on this cathod, coded and uncoded, ex situ, and uh, with the sample uh, representing different uh, charge state uh, along the first uh, uh, cycle. So here I'm summarizing uh, uh, the results which uh, has been obtained uh, by, uh, by uh, looking uh, uh, for uh, what is the manganese role in such materials. Manganese was thought to be not active uh, along the cycling. And what we found is that man manganese actually is redox active and uh, more interesting, interestingly, uh, uh, its, uh, uh, its redox state uh, continues changing in opposition to the expected charge compensation mechanism, which is completely counterintuitive. Um, we were accessing the manganese properties, of course, uh, by each reabsorption spectroscopy at the manganese K edge and X ray emission spectroscopy at the manganese K beta emission line. These measurements were done at the Clive beam line at ALBA, a synchrotron, uh, where it's possible to cover a very, very wide incoming energy range uh, from the sulfur K edge to the iterbium K edge, so almost uh, the periodic table and where uh, emission spectroscopy, spectroscopy uh, is accessible from 6 to 22 keV with decreased efficiency, of course, uh, above 10-12 uh, uh, kilolect volt. The scanning time uh, that we provide uh, is pretty fast, uh, so we can uh, expect uh, one minute uh, per exa spectrum uh, in transmission mode uh, and 15 minutes per emission line. Uh, um, and this allows for, uh, for operando experiments. We are running many operando experiments uh, with the multi-edge approach uh, and as well uh, um, um, self-cycling in parallel uh, along the experiments. <coughs> Sorry. The, the, results, the results have been complemented by oxygen k edge absorption spectra and the manganese L3 edge absorption spectra collected at the mistal beam line in PXM mode. So with the uh, space resolution of uh, uh, 40 nanometer. 
so this is uh, uh, th this slide gives uh, a general idea about the performances uh, of uh, such a beamline, the elements which uh, can be addressed, uh, and uh, a parameter of interest could be the general field of view of uh, such a microscope, which is around 10 micrometers. So let's go through the results. Uh, here you can see the manganese uh, K-edge absorption spectra collected uh, on different uh, samples like situ, uh, representing different uh, charge states, the pristine, before and after the voltage plateau, where we are expecting uh, uh, reactions which then limit the performances of this cathode, the fully charged state and the fully discharged state, PO8. Obviously, what we wanted to know is what was uh, the oxidation state and uh, the manganese oxidation state and its evolution as a function of uh, charging. But such information, it's difficult to univocally access only by the spectra, since the spectra feature also depends on the local magnetic properties, site symmetry, and nature of bonding with surrounding ligands. So we need uh, complementary information. Complementary information are coming from the oxygen K-edge absorption spectra collected on the same data set at, at Mira Streamline. Here you can see the spectra, the absorption peak here. These are uh, again the point which has been uh, investigated uh, along the electrochemical curve. And again, here from this spectra, uh, in the absorption peak, we have information on the manganese uh, oxidation state uh, since uh, it corresponds to the transition from oxygen 1s uh, to the transition metal 3d orbital hybridized with the oxygen 2p. But uh, also in this case, uh, the manganese oxidation state is difficult to access only from the absorption peak, where all the transition metals are contributing, manganese, nickel, and cobalt. So we need to couple the oxygen cage with the manganese cage um, in, or in order to really access to the manganese oxidation state. Moreover, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot, uh, other contribution, other oxygen species uh, can contribute in this, uh, in this, uh, in this peak uh, energy range. So the complementarities of the two techniques became uh, really important. What we have done is to compare manganese K edge and oxygen K edge per peaks, which at the end corresponds to transition uh, to the same orbital, so we'll say, no? to the manganese 3D. So we, we, here you can see the comparison of the per peaks where the rising edge has been subtracted and where the, uh, the manganese K edge spectra has been reshifted. Uh, uh, to overlap, uh, for comparison, the oxygen K edge one. Uh, if we focus on the pristine, uh, we expect uh, to have manganese uh, in the uh, four plus oxidation state uh, and in the high, in the high spin configuration. And we know from the literature that we would expect uh, a two peak structure. <coughs> and that, is exactly, that it is exactly what we see here in both the spectra. What is happening by, by charging? Uh, we see that uh, this uh, uh, dip uh, starts to get filled uh, in both uh, the, 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 the set of spectra more and more uh, uh, by charging. In this, uh, uh, in this uh, energy position, uh, we expect a contribution from uh, manganese 3 plus uh, from, uh, from references. Uh, and the fact that we see the feeling of this uh, dip uh, both uh, in the manganese K edge per peak and in the oxygen K, uh, K edge uh, per peak uh, suggests that uh, it's, uh, it's having uh, at least uh, a partial manganese component. Okay, so we are hypothesizing uh, that uh, manganese is partially reducing uh, uh, during uh, the, uh, during the um, uh, the oxidation uh, that it's uh, uh, counterintuitive. So we need to confirm it. Here you can see the manganese L3 edge spectrum collected on the same system in the same experiment together with the oxygen K edge absorption spectra. And here you can see the shift of this feature A 
towards a lower energy by charging, which is confirming uh, the partial reduce, the reduction uh, of manganese. Okay, here I just uh, focus on pristine and fully charged uh, in order to, uh, to uh, assign uh, uh, the feature labeled uh, as two as a representative of the manganese four plus phase and the feature labeled as P as a representative, uh, let's say, of the rising of the manganese three plus component. And now here you can see the evolution of the intensity of these two features, where the propicia has been deconvoluted with the same model uh, 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 joining in different Gaussian, and uh, the evolution of this, uh, uh, this um, um, of the manganese for plus relative contribution, let's say, as a function of the charge. So here you have the pristine, the charged, and the discharged state. The hard X-ray spectra, so manganese k edge spectra, and the oxygen k edge spectra in red, in black and red, respectively. So we see that the behavior is the same. Effectively, we are supporting uh, uh, our, uh, our interpretation. The open symbols are uh, the coded system. The full symbol are uh, the uncoded system, but at the end, the behavior is the same. The manganese oxidation state evolves in opposition to the main charge compensation mechanism, but the result is not yet quantitative. We want to be quantitative. So which are the manganese possible phases? The manganese possible phases are the layered one, the expected one, manganese four plus uh, I feel. The formation of the spinner space along the charge, which is expected, which has uh, both uh, manganese four plus and manganese three plus uh, I feel part. And then uh, a predicted uh, layered phase uh, with the manganese, the manganese in the T plus low spin configuration. This has never been seen uh, uh, experimentally. In order to disentangle, sorry, in between uh, this, uh, these two possible phases, uh, electronic phases, um, complementary information are needed again. And in this case, we are speaking about uh, X-ray emission spectroscopy at the manganese uh, qubit emission line, which give access uh, to uh, the manganese local magnetic moment. This is thanks to the exchange interaction in between the 3D and, uh, and um, 3P manganese uh, um, uh, orbitals. And, and uh, um, comparing the sample spectra with the reference of known um, local magnetic moment, it's possible to extract quantitatively by the integral of absolute difference respect to a reference. EID method, it's possible to extract quantitatively the manganese local magnetic moment. And this is what you see here on the left. Again, for coded open symbols and uncoded um, samples. So this strong drop corresponds to the formation of the manganese 3 plus low spin layered phase, which in principle is expected to favor cycling. Uh, this jump, uh, little jump here, is most likely correlated uh, with the spinner formation. It is actually correlated uh, with the spinner formation. Um, now, these results are quantitative, uh, while the results uh, on the um, uh, study of the absorption peak are just uh, qualitative uh, because uh, the intensity of the absorption feature depends from many parameters and between them as well the overlaps and between the 3D and the, and the P orbital. So <laughs> we can just extract uh, qualitatively in this case uh, the indicative atomic fraction of manganese C plus uh, low spin uh, uh, fraction respect to the four plus high spin or uh, three plus uh, high spin. So what uh, we saw is that we have uh, um, three coexisting manganese electronic phases, manganese four plus high spin, the layered phase, the same and manganese three plus high spin, which are composing the spinal phase, and the manganese three plus low spin, which are most likely it's in the layered phase, the predicted the layered phase. So what we detect in this study is that we are forming a lot along the charge 
the spinel and uh, at the expenses of the layered space. And in addition, we are um, uh, changing the electronic properties of, of manganese in a direction which could favor the cycling as predicted by Wang and Kowalke. Now, we want still to be quantitative. We need to know how much spinel we are forming quantitatively. And this is accessible by, by investigating the excess spectra, the manganese scared excess spectra by modeling them. <coughs> uh, uh, Laura, I wonder if this, uh, we've got a few questions. I wonder if we can pause here for a moment before we, we can, go to the extended excess. Yeah, the first block didn't end, but uh, definitely we can. Uh, let me read them because okay. it didn't yet. Uh, that's all right. I'm going to have them unmute and ask them so it's in the record. Um, so Yang Ha, you have a question? Yes. Yeah, this is a very interesting talk. I really enjoy seeing you push the limit to analyze the oxygen edge data. But I also have questions. So first, is this a uh, electron yield or is it a fluorescence yield? The, the oxygen cage spectra are in transmission mode. It's a, a, a full field microscope. So we are working in transmission mode directly on the sample. So it's a fluorescence mode. No, no, transmission, not fluorescence. Oh, it's a transmission mode. Wow. Stixum. Yeah. Stixum. Oh, Stixum, I see. Okay. So, so it's the bulk information. So, okay. so of course, uh, of course, uh, uh, a question that can come uh, is uh, what about uh, artifacts? So we were extensively, uh, the sample preparation uh, is important. Uh, the sample cannot be too thick uh, because it's not, we have a compression of the spectra which can affect the ratio in between the, uh, the different feature. So this is effectively an important question. We were addressing this issue in details, uh, and we are sure about our results, of course. Uh, um, but this, I would say that is the only worry about uh, uh, this approach. Okay, and what is the resolution for your data? Because you seem to have multiple components, because you have uh, manganese, cobalt, and the nickel, they all under uh, redox yeah. reactions, and you also mentioned yeah, yeah. The, they have different spin yeah, states. Yeah, they are overlapping. Yeah. Yeah. So, so is it is that the only solution you come up with, or it's just yeah? Uh, uh, the manganese uh, is the fifty six percent of the total transition metal okay. of the cationic site. Let's say the mm -hmm. nickel is the sixteen percent. Uh, and the cobalt uh, is the 8%. So we can say that the cobalt is negligible. I see. So you see, uh, let me come back, uh, if you allow me, on the fact that uh, here are, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this region, uh, in this region, uh, you have as well uh, the nickel uh, and the cobalt component, uh, mainly here, yeah. yeah. Uh, the nickel uh, is transforming nickel four plus uh, uh, almost fully before the voltage plateau, and the cobalt uh, it's, uh, um, is uh, oxidizing as well uh, from three plus to four plus. Uh, but it's, we are not expecting a big effect uh, uh, on the on the spectrum. And the major component is manganese. Uh, of course, uh, only by looking uh, to the oxygen uh, k edge. Uh, uh, the, the contribution of overlaps, uh, and of course, uh, uh, we can hypothesize uh, other oxygen uh, phases, uh, which uh, chemical species, uh, which uh, could uh, contribute in this energy range, uh, like has been done actually by other authors. Uh, but by comparing uh, oxygen K edge and manganese K edge, uh, we can uh, uh, disentangle uh, the manganese uh, contribution uh, univocally. And here you can see the evolution of the results obtained with the same model, exactly the same model, uh, with fixed uh, according to the energy resolution, uh, energy coefficient fixed, and so on. Uh, exactly the same model, you can see 
uh, the evolution of the results obtained by Hartix phase, so only pure manganese uh, contribution in black, with the one obtained by soft X rays in red. Uh, so I think it's quite rabbit. All right, let's um, let's move on at least for the moment. Uh, Yulia, you have a question. Uh, yes, uh, first of all, Laura, very beautiful data. It's Yulia Pushkar from Purdue, and I'm looking forward to apply for beam time in Spain. I have some collaborators there, and I love the country. Uh, so, are, are any of the results you already showed us published? Yes, they are, and okay. the reference are uh, at the beginning of each section uh, here. Okay, so excellent. The, the, each block has the uh, the uh, the reference concerning that block. Um, just uh, noted below. Uh, Effectively, uh, I am mixing differently respect to the publication, uh, the results for uh, an easier understanding. Uh, so you will see this uh, reference uh, popping up again uh, in other blogs. Excellent, thank you. I will study more. Uh, just a very quick comment. So I work on oxygen evolving complex, which also has manganese 4 and manganese 3 plus. But the only my like first reaction when I see your data if you oxidize your sample and you start to see manganese three plus, you might be making peroxide somewhere. That's like the first reaction. I don't know whether it's true or not. And the second reaction, I don't think manganese likes to be low spin. So I'm wondering if you have a calculations or proposal of the manganese uh, yeah. plus side with the low spin. Mm -hmm. Ala, for the two question, I, I know I understand the question. I hope that I understood the question, let's say. Uh, the fact that we are comparing oxygen cage with the manganese cage that see only manganese uh, is key because uh, manganese cage uh, uh, cannot see peroxide, no? So if the correlation uh, is uh, one to one, uh, there is uh, at least uh, a strong manganese C plus uh, contribution. Strong, uh, at least partial. Uh, for what is concerned, the second question, yes, there are calculation. Uh, I agree. I never saw as well uh, empirically, except in this case, uh, manganese P plus in low spin configuration. Uh, actually, to my knowledge, uh, uh, it has been predicted only uh, in 2007 by Wang. There is this reference. And they are uh, estimating as well that this space uh, should exist uh, and uh, should be rhomboidral uh, and uh, should favor uh, reversible cycling. I, I, did I answer to your question? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And a, a last question for this break, Constantin. Yeah, hello. Um, hi, Laura. Uh, I wonder if uh, radiation damage is a problem. Um, yeah, very good point. It will pop up towards the end of the, of the presentation. Actually not. In this case, we didn't detect uh, any radiation damage. But it's true that we were measuring uh, um, at least the experiment that I'm presenting here, ex situ. Uh, to my experience, uh, uh, we have a lot of radiation damage uh, in a lot of systems, uh, uh, not so much in this one, uh, but in others, uh, um, with operandum experiments. Yeah. I saw as well dissolving uh, the cadets uh, into the electrolyte in some cases. Uh, so the, the radiation damage uh, can be really a big issue, a challenge, actually. And, and when you measure these objects, this is a complete battery or somehow the cathode is extracted? No. These are just the electrodes. The, the, the cells have been cycled uh, in the Helmholtz Institute uh, and the carrots uh, once uh, uh, stopped the cell that was cycled up until a certain extent, uh, washed and so on, has been then measured at Clive's uh, or at Mistral. The only attention was put in avoiding uh, interaction there. So all the sample manipulation has been done in Globox, 
but I'm not sure that it's really necessary for such systems. It was just to avoid the problem. So we didn't test that that necessity, let's say. Okay, thank you. Excellent, you should continue, please. Okay, just a second. I was uh, here. Okay, so uh, so we want uh, to really be quantitative. Uh, we detected the deformation of uh, two new electronic phases uh, as a function of uh, charging. And now we want to know how much. So here uh, by manganese scale excess, uh, we were extracting such information quantitatively by modeling the spectra, considering uh, uh, two phases, uh, a layered uh, and the thinner phase. Of course, uh, we were careful about, uh, co uh, about um, uh, correlations uh, and we were ensuring that the number of uh, free parameters were below the limit, uh, obviously. Okay, so here, finally, we are uh, fully quantitative. Uh, on the left, uh, you can see the tipping results, uh, uh, which are uh, um, detecting uh, the spin formation uh, at the expenses of the layered one. So from the pristine to the beginning of the voltage plateau, we are forming almost nothing of just a little bit of the spin, and then there is a massive uh, formation uh, along the voltage plateau. And this is uh, fully reversible. <coughs> Knowing uh, this, uh, we can finally extract uh, quantitatively, combining with the uh, with the emission measurements, uh, uh, the uh, amount of the different uh, manganese electronic spaces. Then uh, we need to know, uh, of course, about the other transition metals. Uh, in this uh, uh, work, we were, uh, 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 we were a bit approximative because uh, we were assuming that cobalt, which is only the 8% anyhow of the cationic contribution, was uh, oxidizing uh, as uh, reported in the literature uh, uh, before the voltage plateau fully from three plus to four plus. Then the nickel oxidation state has been extracted uh, uh, by the extra data, by the interatomic distances uh, in according, accordingly with, uh, with the literature and we characterize like this, uh, this oxidation. And now we can have an idea about uh, the oxygen oxidation state uh, and its evolution as a function of the charge, considering or not uh, uh, oxygen vacancies, uh, which of course uh, uh, are present uh, at the end at least of the charge uh, in the uh, in the system. So this is uh, finally very nice. Uh, we start to be quantitative. Uh, this result is not perfect, uh, like I was saying, because we don't have uh, uh, direct information on the cobalt, but this is uh, coming uh, later on uh, in the next uh, part. So <coughs> now uh, I'm starting the uh, second block. So I don't know if there are more questions uh, about the first one. I if think not, you should uh, uh, continue. We took such a long break uh, uh, there. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Keep, keep going. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So now the point is, uh, we saw that there are coexisting phases uh, uh, as soon as we are charging and we want to control them uh, because the performances of the battery depends uh, from the coexisting phases. At least we would like uh, to suppress uh, the spinel phase formation. And the results of uh, this block is that actually strain is a possible controlling parameter. <laughs> In fact, uh, we saw that the manganese oxidation and speed state uh, is, are strongly affected by the strains produced by coating uh, or by the nickel redox, uh, which uh, imply a strong shrinking uh, locally. So let's come back to nickel. The nickel uh, for plus formation uh, can be extracted by the oxygen cage spectra uh, from the shoulder, which is uh, um, rising uh, at lower energies. So with the model that I was uh, describing before of Gaussian, which are the convoluted and different feature, we were extracting as well uh, the nickel for plus formation. Okay. And uh, it's reported uh, here in panel A for uncoated the full simple and coated and coated the vanadium oxygen coated the uh, carrots uh, open symbols. Now you can compare panel A and panel B, where panel B is reporting uh, 
the, uh, the relative evolution of the manganese 4 plus uh, ice cream phase. The interesting thing is that you can see that the coded and uncoded behavior do not uh, overlap, but as soon as we are plotting uh, um, the, the, the intensity, intensity of, the, of the nickel four plus formation of uh, feature one uh, against the intensity of the relative uh, manganese four plus fraction, feature two divided by the sum of two and three, we can see that we have a linearity, we have a, 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 a correlation. Actually, what we saw is that the nickel redox reaction seems correlated to the observed manganese reduction. And it's really interesting. If it is the case, we could expect it also spatially. And actually, we have this information because we were acquiring the absorption spectra with the TXM <coughs> in transmission mode with the resolution of uh, 40 nanometer and the field of view of 10 micrometers. So we have access to the uh, particles which are composing the, um, the, uh, the system. Uh, uh, we have one image per energy point, of course, uh, and we can treat that images in order to highlight the formation of, of a feature or a contrast. Um, we can highlight, for example, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the nickel four plus formation, uh, and these are the images uh, A and D that are reported here uh, for a relatively charged state, uh, PO4. We can see that the nickel is uh, mainly in the, in the, in the middle. We, we select the isolated nanoparticle in order to avoid the artifacts to the compression of the spectra. And, uh, and we were following uh, cuts, uh, which represent a nickel four plus uh, uh, <coughs> profile and the contrast in between nickel three plus and nickel four plus stages. And we found a nice correlation. So what do we found? We found that there is a special correlation that suggests a possible cause effect in between the nickel shrinking and manganese three plus <coughs> uh, formation. Then we were more precise. Uh, we understood uh, that we can exploit as well uh, uh, the manganese L3 edge for the same game. Actually, the shift towards uh, low energies uh, of uh, this, uh, uh, this first sharp feature corresponded to the spin formation since uh, uh, the uh, low spin uh, um, manganese C plus phase uh, has an electronic structure of very much similar to the manganese three plus, four plus high spin. So we don't expect uh, such a variation uh, in such electronic phases. And what we did, uh, we were uh, uh, visualizing like this, uh, the spinal formation, uh, the amount as well of spinal formation along the, 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 the particles uh, uh, by peaks and by treating the images. The interesting result is that uh, quantitatively, the amount of spin that we can visualize uh, like this, uh, it's exactly the same as what we found by the extra skipping uh, for all the samples. Uh, and this is uh, strengthening, uh, uh, of course, uh, the results. Uh, below, you can see the formation on nickel 4 plus. Uh, and, uh, and of course, it's possible then to, to address the correlation uh, in between uh, the two. Second step, uh, second block end. I don't know if there are, uh, there are uh, questions on it. No questions right now. Why don't you continue? Now, uh, I, I will enter in the full quantification of the charge compensation mechanism and attention on anionic and cationic um, contribution. In addition, in this section, I'm adding uh, the, uh, the, 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 the charge rate parameter uh, and its effect uh, on, uh, uh, on the system. So uh, quickly, <coughs> here you can see the voltage profile uh, with two charge rates. This is just the first charge. Uh, there is uh, the standard charge rate, 0.1C, and a very fast charge rate, 5C and 1C. The voltage profiles uh, have been, in panel B, corrected 
take into account the current land use of a potential and possible side reaction uh, uh, to identify the correct charge state, to identify what we can compare with what, radically speaking. Uh, below, you can see the Fourier transform of the excess data collected at manganese, cobalt, and nickel k -head. In this case, uh, we, we have as well the cobalt. This is a new data set on the same system. We obtain similar results, everything comforting. And what we see is that the charge rate turns out to have generally a very weak effect on the local structure. <coughs> Here, the same game. You can see the spinel formation with different charge rates. You see that by speeding up the charging, we are forming more spinel. And this is not really desired. And uh, by speeding up the charge, uh, we can see that uh, uh, both nickel and cobalt are faster in uh, oxidizing. Uh, again, we can couple with the k-beta emission line uh, of manganese. Uh, we can extract uh, quantitatively the different uh, uh, electronic phases. Uh, and we can uh, finally extract uh, quantitatively the oxygen oxidation state. Uh, and uh, what we can see is that uh, higher charge rate anticip anticipate, like we saw, nickel and cobalt uh, uh, oxidation, but reduce the oxygen oxidation. It's slower the oxy oxygen oxidation. And oxygen is uh, probably the main actor uh, in providing such a big capacity. No? So uh, here we are uh, either better understanding the charge compensation me mechanism. You can see on uh, the, in this uh, figure, the global anionic and cationic contribution in black and red respectively, and in the inset, you can see uh, the same quantity respect to the pristine. What we see is that the cationic contribution is reversible, except for the irreversible spin formation of the 6%, uh, and quantitatively everything match. And the anionic contributions, uh, obviously, the same data, and the anionic contribution, uh, it's reversible only up to the end of the voltage plateau, after which we have oxygen release uh, and uh, irreversibility. Uh, what we saw is that increasing the charge rate, uh, the increasing of the charge rate anticipates the cation oxidation, uh, while decreasing uh, the anion contribution along the voltage plateau. So we can say that we are suppressing uh, the reversible anionic redox uh, at increased uh, charge rate. This is an important result, and it is, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, confirmed by the next slide, when instead uh, I am reporting temporal dependent uh, X-ray absorption uh, spectroscopy studies. Uh, I'm particularly happy to show it because uh, this is an approach from physics uh, applied to chemistry, uh, uh, that I think is particularly useful uh, in the field of uh, uh, batteries. Indeed, uh, by a temperature dependent study, we can access the lattice uh, stiffness uh, that uh, intuitively uh, can uh, affect uh, the ion diffusion uh, to the lattice. Moreover, at low temperature, we are accessing the static and structural disorder, which is as, as well very much informative. Uh, for example, uh, coexisting phases are obviously increasing uh, the, uh, the static uh, disorder. <coughs> Moreover, it has been very recently reported how there is an interaction uh, in between the electronic structure and the lattice rigidity. And in particular, it has been reported uh, that the reversibility of anionic redox scales uh, with the degree of overlapping between the transition metal, uh, the orbital, and the oxygen to P states. Uh, so with the lattice rigidity. So this is uh, uh, really, really interesting. So what we saw is that by charging, we have an increase of the static disorder, which of course corresponds to the coexistence of several phases. And this disorder increase, uh, it's faster in the, in the fast charge rate where we have uh, this more thin formation, okay. And then we see the softening of the lattice by charging that favors the ion diffusion that is in agreement with the previous results. The results are shown by you and co-workers. And, uh, uh, and what we see is that by increasing uh, uh, 
the charge rate, we are, uh, we are uh, softening more uh, the lattice and we are uh, suppressing uh, the reversible anionic redox. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a way to access uh, to this information, which is relatively easy and effective. Uh, all the, the data that I was showing were uh, from ex situ experiments, uh, but of course uh, uh, we want uh, to access super random measurements. So we are running a lot of super random measurements on battery supplies, uh, either if I didn't report uh, them here. But uh, what I would like uh, to show you is that uh, these super random measurements are all done with the same setup uh, of uh, standard setup with two coin cells, which are running in par parallel. Uh, that permit uh, multi-edge uh, uh, experiments uh, or uh, multi, uh, multi-modal uh, experiments, absorption and emission uh, in operando condition, uh, and as well uh, permit to reach uh, the sulfur K edge, uh, which is uh, relatively uh, tricky. Uh, so here uh, there are data that we collected recently on a sulfur battery in operando mode uh, and that uh, has been just recently accepted uh, <coughs> on advanced material. So, um, so let me uh, go uh, on another block. I don't know if there are questions on what uh, I, I well, just... Can, uh, continue, I can continue, continue to your conclusions. Yeah, keep going. So, Exactly. So there is the last block that highlights the current technical challenges, of course, uh, and the future developments, some of them already ongoing. So there is the, uh, the, um, the issue of the information depth, the penetration depth. The soft X rays are mainly to stay sensitive and to access possible buried interface or operando condition became a challenge. Okay, so this is an important point. Uh, at Mistral Beamline already, uh, they are developing uh, a new setup uh, for accessing operando condition with the TXM uh, in between 300 and 1200 EV, so really nice. Then for what is concerned the hard X-ray uh, absorption spectroscopy, it is of course poorly sensitive to the surface and interface phenomena, so this is uh, a problem. A possible way to turn around it and to acquire simultaneously information on the bulk and on the surface is to acquire simultaneously, simultaneously the spectra either in total, electron, in, total, in total electron yield and either in fluorescence mode or in transmission mode. So this is really nice. Sometimes it has been already exploited. Uh, but the possible overlap of electrochemical charge in operando experiments uh, and uh, the, the green current uh, uh, to measure the spectra need to be addressed the ones who want to move towards operando. And uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, requires further development, uh, either to stop the electrochemical cycling intermittent, intermittent way, sorry, I don't manage to pronounce the word, uh, either to, uh, to acquire differently the electrochemistry with the uh, multiplication, I don't know. So another technical challenge uh, and future development uh, uh, concern imaging, of course, the 2D and 3D spatial resolution that can be achieved uh, either by scanning or by fulfilled transmission mode, like I was showing before. The major issue is uh, how to access operando. Of course, uh, four generation synchrotron will help uh, both in reducing the beam size uh, naturally, uh, both uh, by providing coherence which will allow to access the nanometric spatial resolution, uh, but, uh, uh, and both by providing the brilliance necessary for a relatively fast scanning. No? Uh, the disadvantage uh, uh, is that uh, this system is strongly sensitive to radiation damage, like pointed out by Constantin. And uh, so attention absolute, uh, absolutely should be done. This is the main uh, drawback. And this is the same for what we concern time resolution that affect, uh, that, that, uh, that, um, that depends from the signal to noise ratio. Uh, intensity, of course, uh, is helpful for, uh, for uh, going faster. It will help for sure imaging, uh, imaging and, uh, and, um, and as well emission spectroscopy, which is more photosensitive technique. Uh, 
Um, but again, uh, we have to be careful about the radiation damage. Uh, last point, I guess, uh, if I remember correctly, is concerning uh, uh, the big data set. Uh, working uh, in operando condition or with the high throughput approaches uh, uh, means uh, big data sets uh, to deal with. So we need the data extraction, visualization, and analysis of such data, which are efficient and, uh, and, um, and uh, easy. Uh, we are working on it, of course, like in many other synchrotrons. Uh, here there are a few examples of uh, uh, software developed by Carlo Marini, uh, my, <coughs> um, and working with me at class. So, uh, uh, I mean, this is something, this is a lot of work done, but there is still a lot of work to be done, and it's something where it's necessary to invest, to my opinion. So, finally, this is the last slide, sorry, the conclusion. Stuff. What I wanted to stress uh, uh, in this presentation is the necessity of a multi-technique approach to really disentangle the uh, naturally entangled parameters. And uh, what I wanted to point out is that uh, there are intrinsic complementarities, as you perfectly know, in between absorption and emission spectroscopy and by comparing uh, different uh, X-ray energy ranges. Uh, in particular, uh, with this uh, approach, uh, we were, uh, I think, that uh, we really managed to un fully understand the charge compensation mechanism, uh, the cation and the anion chemistries uh, in a class of cathode materials. Uh, and uh, we were also highlighting controlling parameters uh, as trains uh, in, the, in the shown case, uh, uh, which can permit uh, to tune a phase respect to another one. Uh, I wanted to stress the importance of a multi-scale approach, uh, which can give insights on the cause effect uh, of what we observe. So not only it's giving information about the spatial distribution of coexisting phases, uh, but also to, uh, to understand uh, which are the controlling parameters uh, to affect them. Moreover, uh, either if I didn't uh, show it, uh, it can permit uh, to investigate the homogeneity or dishomogeneity and, uh, and uh, the, this homogeneity or dishomogeneity during the dynamics or related to the dynamics. Uh, operando, operando, of course, uh, it's a target uh, um, uh, and there are a few uh, technical challenges, uh, mainly in the soft X-ray regime. So we need to expand the operando capabilities we need uh, to improve spatial and time resolution, probably. Uh, either if time resolution, perhaps it's necessary only for imaging, uh, because uh, uh, the time resolution of uh, uh, the beam line all, all often match already the typical charging rate. And then a big issue is uh, the fact that we need to deal with big data sets, uh, and we are not ready yet, probably. Uh, the main bottleneck, uh, empirically speaking, uh, is the radiation damage, of course, uh, uh, that uh, needs to be addressed uh, system by system. Okay, that's it. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, the founding agency and, uh, and thank you for uh, your attention. A wonderful talk. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'll start with a, a question. So you've disentangled um, uh, the charge transfer effects and and whatnot for the anion and the uh, uh, and the cation. Um, how does knowing that for the NMC help you to either design better related materials also in the NMC family, or what does it teach you about and more generally how do you make better battery electrodes? Mm, I'm not sure that I got the question. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll rephrase more simply, I apologize. Um, you've learned a lot of basic science about how the battery material works. How does this help you make better batteries in the future? Okay, fine. Uh, we saw that the strain uh, can uh, um, favor or not uh, the spinal phase for, it, for instance. That it's a one of uh, the. It, it's not uh, uh, the main uh, actor uh, in uh, in uh, uh, 
that it's, I mean, a spin, the formation of the spinal space, it's a limiting uh, the, uh, the capacity. And then it's the treatment for, uh, for, uh, for cycling. I don't know where there is the Yampeller effect that has been uh, mentioned, you know? Yeah, uh, that has been uh, considered, uh, uh, considered in the spinal space, uh, uh, the treatment uh, uh, structurally uh, for the cycling. Uh, if we want to avoid the, the spinal phase, uh, we need to find what is the parameter that can control it. So what we found is uh, it's not the resist uh, to uh, eliminate the spinal formation, but it is that the, the, the strain, it's a favoring uh, or uh, the contrary, the spinal formation. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a step forward uh, in the elimination of the spinal <laughs> formation to my point of view. I don't know if I express myself. I think so. I understand. Okay. okay. Uh, last question, uh, Yang Ha. Hi again. So uh, I, I saw you mention something about uh, controlling uh, reversible oxygen redox. I just wonder how do you quantify the amount of reversible oxygen redox? Do you use the total capacity minus the capacity from uh, the transition metal redox, or do you have any? Others uh, once, uh, yeah, once that uh, we have, it's a simple issue. Um, once we have uh, the oxidation state of uh, all the transition metal uh, and the capacity, which uh, tell us how much lithium there is, uh, mm -hmm. we have uh, everything except to the oxygen. So we can... Uh, um, so you assume everything else is from oxygen? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Thanks.